An ideal regenerative Rankine cycle with a closed feed water heater uses water as the working fluid. The turbine inlet is operated at 500 psi and 600 degrees Fahrenheit, and the condenser is maintained at 5 psi. Steam is supplied to the feed water heater at 40 psi before being expanded into the condenser. Determine and complete the following. First, Y, the proportion of mass flow rate that leaves the turbine early to feed the closed feed water heater, the specific work in relative to the cycle as a whole, and the thermal efficiency. So note that in this problem, we still have the medium pressure occurring at 7 and 3 for the closed feed water heater, but instead of compressing it up to the high pressure before mixing, we are expanding it down to the low pressure before mixing. That means that one pump is accomplishing all of the work, and that 1, 2, 5, and 6 all have the mass flow rates of the cycle. Let's start by identifying our independent intensive properties for the state points so that we can then determine the specific work in, the specific Q in, the specific work out, and the specific Q out, and then the thermal efficiency. I will start this process by pointing out that we still have three pressures, 500 psi, 5 psi, and 40 psi. Which state points have the high pressure? 2, 5, and 6. Which state points have the low pressure? 8, 4, and 1. That leaves 3 and 7 with the intermediate pressure. So I will populate one independent intensive property for all eight of our state points using pressure. Next, I will consider the pump and the turbine. I was given no indication as to an operational efficiency, so I will assume that they are both 100% efficient. That means that the process from 1 to 2 is assumed to be isentropic, because an isentropic process represents the ideal work for a turbine and a pump, and then I assume that S7 and S8 are all equal to S6. That leaves me with state point 1, 3, 4, 5, and 6 left hanging. State 6 is easy. We have a temperature. So state 6 has a temperature of 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Next, I'll assume that the condenser just condenses, and in this case is also a mixing chamber, but the condenser condenses, and as soon as the water has condensed, it leaves the condenser. It's just a mechanical device where water condenses and then it falls to the bottom and leaves. There's nothing to refrigerate it, to subcool it, to hypercompress it. There is just a condensing process and then the water leaves, so we assume it leaves as a saturated liquid. Then 3, 4, and 5. Well, I can make the same assumption about state 3 that I did in the previous problem, where I had assumed based on the same concept of using latent energy for the heat exchange, that the water that leaves at 3 has condensed and leaves. And then, because I'm assuming that our closed feed water heater is operating ideally, because I was given no indication otherwise, I'm going to use the same relationship for maximum conditions, which is a temperature at 5 being equal to a temperature at 3, That leaves me with state point four. And to answer that question, let me pose a question. What do we know about expansion valves? Well, if we were to set up an energy balance on the expansion valve, I have no opportunities for heat transfer nor work. Therefore, this open system undergoing a steady process would have its energy balance simplified down to the sum in of m dot theta is equal to the sum out of m dot theta. Theta contains enthalpy, kinetic energy, and potential energy. So if I neglect changes in kinetic and potential energy, I'm left with m.3 h3 is equal to m.4 h4. And then, if the mass flow rate at 3 has to equal state 4, because it's a steady device with one inlet and one outlet, then h3 must equal h4. Therefore, 
we treat expansion valves as being isenthalpic, that is, of a constant enthalpy. So I use X1 and P1 to look up S1, then I use S2 to, and P2 to look up H2. I guess I also look up H1 using X1 and P1. Then I use X3 and P3 to look up H3 and use H4 being equal to H3 to announce that H4 is known. And then I use T5 and P5 to look up H5. So I have to go back to state 3 and look up the saturation temperature corresponding to our 40 PSI. Then I use T6 and P6 to look up H6 and S6. Then I use S6 to look up H7 and H8 using the pressure at the medium pressure and the low pressure respectively. So I have everything I need to perform all eight enthalpy lookups. So let's just assume that we had them and move on. The next process would be to calculate the specific work in, the specific Q in, the specific work out, and the specific Q out. The specific work in is going to be occurring in the one and only pump. Let me back up a second. We're defining Y as the mass flow rate that leaves the turbine early. So I'm calling Y M.7 over M.6, and then the remainder, 1 minus Y, is M.8 over M.6. And I recognize that. 1, 2, 5, and 6 are all the same, and they are all the mass flow rate through the cycle. Then 8 stands alone, and 7, 3, and 4 are all the same. So specific work into the cycle would be the total power input divided by m dot cycle, which would be m dot one times h two minus h one divided by m dot cycle. Because m dot one is equal to m dot cycle, that means my specific work in is just h two minus h one. For Q in, I'm looking at the boiler. The boiler also has the mass flow rate through the cycle flowing through it, which means that I'm just going to be left with h six minus h five. For our specific workout, we have the same exact energy balance that we have had for the previous two examples. So I'm going to use H6 minus YH7 minus the quantity 1 minus YH8. And if you want to see why, unintended, you can go back and watch those videos again. H6 minus YH7 minus the quantity 1 minus YH8. And then. And then specific Q out is going to be the complicated one this time because I have multiple inlets and outlets. So let's just walk through that energy balance. I have entering mass flow rate at eight and four. Let me double check those state point numbers. And because I have a steady device that is an open system, my energy balance is going to simplify quite a bit. One, two, skip a few. I can jump to writing Q as well as the sum in of m dot theta is equal to Q dot out plus the sum out of m dot theta because there's no opportunities for heat transfer in nor work and it's an open system operating steadily. And then theta contains enthalpy plus specific kinetic energy plus specific potential energy. So if we assume that changes in kinetic and potential energy are negligibly small, that means I'm left with the sum in of m dot h. There are two inlets, so that would be m dot 8 h8 plus m dot 4 h4 is equal to q dot out plus M dot one H one, the one and only outlet. Therefore, Q dot out is going to be M dot eight H eight 
plus m.4 h4 minus m.1 h1. And then if I divide everything by m dot cycle, I'm going to be left with m dot 8 divided by m dot cycle, which is 1 minus y plus m dot 4 divided by m dot cycle, which is y minus oh, y times h4 minus m dot 1 divided by m dot cycle, which is just 1 h1. So with these four equations, I can calculate my specific works and heat transfers. From that, I can determine my network and net heat transfer, and then thermal efficiency. All I need to do that are my eight enthalpies, which you'll remember I totally know by now because I totally looked them up, and why. So in order to be able to complete the problem, we are going to have to determine why. And remember, in order to compute why, we have to perform an energy balance on a device about which we know everything. We can't analyze the boiler, the turbine, the condenser, nor the pump, because I don't know Q in, work out, Q out, nor work in. The expansion valve is boring, there's not much to do there, therefore I'm left with the energy balance on the closed feed water heater. So that energy balance is something that we've done before, so I will go through it relatively quickly. So I'm going to have the sum in of m.h is equal to the sum out of m.h because there's no opportunities for heat transfer nor work and changes in kinetic and potential energy are negligibly small. So I'm going to write that as m.2h2 plus m.7h7. That is equal to the sum out of m.theta, which is going to be m.5h5. plus m.3 h3 and then I'm going to group together my mass flow rates to limit how many y's I have to keep track of so 2 and 5 will be together and that's increasing in energy so I'm going to want to write that as m.2 times h5 minus h2 that would be the right hand side of my equation so I'm left with m.7 times h7 minus h3 5 minus 2, 7 minus 3, energy gained, energy lost, that makes sense. Next I will divide everything by m dot cycle. m dot 2 divided by m dot cycle is 1 because m dot 2 is equal to m dot 6 and m dot cycle and m dot 6 are the same. So note here that if you had just copied over the energy balance on the closed feed water heater, complete with all the algebra below it, from the previous problem, you would have an incorrect answer because the mass flow rates are different. 7 and 3 are both y here, so m.7 divided by m.cycle cycle is just going to be y times h7 minus h3. Therefore, y is equal to h5 minus h2 divided by h7 minus h3. So at this point, all that's left to do to finish the question is look up our eight enthalpies, plug them into this relationship down here to determine y, plug our enthalpies and our y values into these relationships to determine the work in the Q and the work out in the Q out, and then compute a network out and a thermal efficiency. So again, because the property lookups are supposed to be something that you master in thermal one, it's a little bit outside the scope, of thermo 2 for me to spend a whole bunch of time in this example problem video looking those properties up. So I'm just going to look them up and cut that out of this video. If you want to see where I got the numbers, I will include the work with this PDF so that you can follow it. That will be linked in the description below the video. But in the meantime, here we go. You ready? All eight enthalpies. Three, two, one. Now that we have all eight enthalpies, calculating y, it's just a matter of computing some numbers together. For that, we will use our calculator, we'll wake up calculator, and I am going to take h5 minus h2, 
which is 237.35 minus 133.27 divided by 7 minus 3, which is 1085.02. Minus 236.16. That yields 0 0.1226. Now we can take that number and plug it into our relationships for work in Q and work out in Q out. So I'm beginning with H2 minus H1 which is 133.27 minus 130.17, which gives us 3.1. And then H6 minus H5 would be 1298.3 minus 237.35, giving me 1060.95. And then H6 minus Y times H7, so 1298.3 minus Y times H7 minus the quantity 1 minus Y times H8 yields 328.0. And then 1 minus y times h8, which is this quantity I already have. Probably would have been faster just to start over, but here we are. <laughs> 1 minus y times h8 plus y times h4, which was 236.16. Minus h1 which is 130.17, and I get 735.972. And then from those quantities, I can determine a network out, a net heat transfer in, and a thermal efficiency. So 328 and change minus three and change yields 324.978 and then Q in minus Q out is the same number, which indicates that we built those equations correctly. And then we take that number, and we divide by Q in to yield thermal efficiency of 30.6%. So part A asked for Y. Part B asked for specific work in. And part C asked for thermal efficiency, which means that we are done with our calculations. What I would like to do next is probably unsurprising. I'd like to plot this on a TS diagram. So state one is going to be here, low pressure, assumed to be a saturated liquid, then state two is directly above it, 
all the way on the high pressure side. And you can draw that a little bit better. Also, let's switch to black so it's easier to see. One and two. And then from state two, we are gaining a little bit of heat before we get to state five. And state five was a compressed liquid. So I'm going to leave that in our compressed liquid region. I'm going to call that, oh, I don't know, right about here. And then it goes all the way up to state six, which is our maximum temperature and pressure. I will call right here. And then that expands down to seven and eight, which are directly below it. I believe seven and eight were both saturated liquid vapor mixtures, and they are quality of 0 0.9 and 0 0.82. So my graph isn't perfectly to scale here, but hopefully it gets the point across. And then seven gives up some of its heat going to three, which is a saturated liquid. And then we have a line of constant enthalpy from three to four. Remember, those look like this. So, encountering the low pressure line. And then that is meeting the process from eight to one. So we end up with a process line like this. And that's our diagram.